Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 392nd episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest on today's podcast is Christopher Heck. Christopher is a founding partner of Tanager Wealth Management, an REA based in London, England, that oversees approximately $1.1 billion in assets under management for 630 client households. What's unique about Christopher, though, is how his firm has scaled to more than a billion dollars of AUM while specializing in working with clients whose personal and financial lives touch both the United States and the United Kingdom, a a niche for which there is no set playbook to learn all the tax and estate and and other financial expertise needed to serve these clients, which makes the expertise they've crafted for themselves over the past decade instantly differentiated in the marketplace. In this episode, we talk in depth about how Christopher chose his unique cross-border specialization, in part due to his own experience as a U.S. expatriate navigating the financial issues that come with living and working in the U.K., why Christopher's firm emphasizes the ability to teach other team members about technical planning topics, since team members have to learn most of the specialized knowledge on the job, as a key criterion when hiring and evaluating new staff members to join Tanager Wealth, and how Christopher's firm uses an internal blog and videos and regular lunch and learns to further transmit their internal specialized knowledge across all the advisors in the firm. We also talk about how Christopher's firm has attracted clients within its cross-border U.S.-U.K. specialization, including by establishing relationships early on with accountants and estate attorneys who were also just starting their practices and working with similar expatriate clients, which created a healthy system of cross-referrals as each of those professionals' own practices have grown over the years. How Christopher's cross-border specialization has evolved into several sub-niches, including expats who work specifically in the technology, financial, and legal sectors and how Christopher's firm specialized expertise gives them an edge, uh, even and including against much larger firms in the broader market for financial advice. And be certain to listen to the end, where Christopher shares how his firm's separate advisory and planning teams not only help build and maintain his firm's knowledge base, but also provide separate career tracks for employees who want to be client-facing or those who just want to dig deeper into the technical aspects of financial planning. How starting his firm with two other partners gave Christopher the added confidence he needed to overcome the feelings of imposter syndrome that kicked in when working with clients in his chosen but still developing specialization at the time. And why Christopher believes that REAs are in reality HR and technology platforms that simply monetize with financial expertise to emphasize the importance of having the right people in tech to be able to successfully build and scale a firm. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoy this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Christopher Heck. Welcome, Christopher Heck, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Thank you, Michael. It's great to be here. I'm, I'm really excited to have you on the, on the podcast today and, and get to talk a little bit about uh, kind of the, the dynamics when we start crafting uh, some kind of specialization to differentiate ourselves where there really is no no textbook, no no playbook about about how it works. Uh, you know, I, I find from the business perspective, those often make some of the best specializations, like the best ways to differentiate. Because if, if there's really no no textbook or standard designation for it, then almost by definition, you have a you have a really differentiated expertise if you can create that. Because no one else would know how to do it unless they learn it all from scratch. The bad news, of course, is you you have to learn it all from scratch and figure out how to, <laughs> how to get the knowledge yeah. because there's no textbook and, and standard playbook about how this works. And and for a lot of us, then like the imposter syndrome starts kicking in. I don't really maybe know as much as they think I know. Are they going to catch me and find out that I'm still kind of figuring out some of the specialization as I go? And, and just, I, I know you've you've lived a, a version of this, you know, your particular journey is around the dynamics of, of working with cross-border clients, going back and forth between the the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, and, and so, I'm I'm excited to talk about this this path of like how how you figure out how to how to become specialized in in a in a unique kind of clientele like this when you can't just you know go get the designation that teaches you all the things about how to do this. Yeah, and it's it's 
it's it's great that you you mentioned that because that is that is something I remind myself every day, and I remind uh, my, my business partners and some of our teammates, you know, as we're tackling whatever challenge of the day there is, and you know, there's a challenge every day, just like I'm sure in in most advisory practices, and we're trying to figure out something really hard, and doesn't seem to have any obvious answer to it, and I just have to remind myself and remind whoever I'm, I'm working with at that moment in time that if it was easy, one of the really big firms would have done this and they would have scaled up and they would have absolutely captured this market. So we should be very thankful that there's challenges and that there is no playbook because it gives us the opportunity to be creative and thoughtful in how we work on behalf of our clients and, and improve the business and improve our knowledge. Uh, because if there was a playbook, I can guarantee you the big firms would have it. I, I love that. That's like a very... Um efficient markets like investment <laughs> view of the of the landscape like you know if this was easily exploitable then markets would have arbitraged away already like that's how that's how market opportunities work so you know we 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 can we can be successful and differentiated and even command a premium for our services like because we're doing a hard thing that's not easy for someone to just run the playbook scale it up and dominate that market that's a, a great way to summarize it. That's absolutely it. That, you know, if you would all believe in a, even semi-efficient uh, investment markets, you have to appreciate that your only edge is is something that other people don't have because it just didn't exist before. You know, and in the early days of, of high-speed trading, it might have been faster computers, although everyone can kind of buy faster computers now. Maybe it's something along the lines of, you know, if you're trying to run a hedge fund or find uh, very scarce and difficult uh, alpha that you have some private information because you maybe are a doctor. So you understand drug testing and then you can understand and interpret the results from a biotech company better than the next person can because you have this special knowledge in you know drug testing or whatever it might be. Um, and, and that's exactly what it is in, in our niche uh, is, is trying to create that knowledge and create that edge uh, because the knowledge probably didn't exist before we beat our head against the wall for three months to figure it out. Well, and, and it, it strikes me as well uh, that it, it reminds me that there, there, you know, there's sort of these old models about how professional services firms kind of build, build and, and, and grow that you know, one problem, one version is like you, you find a problem that a lot of people have and you just get it, you just look craft like a really good procedure about how to, how to do it and solve it. You're like, we help people with this. It's not the most complex thing, but just like it's it's solvable and doable, and we're really efficient at doing it, so we can you know provide a high quality solution at a very reasonable price, and 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 off you go on your merry way. But then there's another subset of businesses where, you know, like you you literally hire their their brains, their smarts, their ability to figure out how to solve a problem that is legitimately complex and unique. It's like by definition, there is no known and established answer and literally your value is we're good at figuring these things out i can tell you we don't have the answer because you have a problem that no one's ever had before but we will figure a solution out for you because we're good we're good at the figuring out process and we know enough of the the dynamics and the context and the nuances and understand enough of the complexity to be able to figure out uh, a, a good solution and just it, it it strikes me that you you kind of live more in that in that realm, like you're not paying us because we just have a, a really efficient process to do the thing that you want done. Part of what you're paying us for is you genuinely live in a place that no one has the answer and we're better at figuring out the answers to questions that people haven't solved before. Yeah, absolutely. It's a lot like, um, I guess, modern Silicon Valley firms, you know, that do several acqui hires every year where they're going out and finding someone who can build better databases or better artificial intelligence language models or uh, maybe big four consulting type firms uh, where they've, you know, they've went into to firms that are having corporate challenges or whatever sales or uh, operational challenges that they're having. And chances are that no one has solved that before because who has ever done this? And, and we're kind of living in the same realm. Um, so very, very different from, let's say, the, the stack it high and sell it cheap model of perhaps, uh, let's say, plain vanilla uh, index fund managers is something that certainly in our industry comes to mind. Uh, I don't know how you compete with them in, in plain vanilla uh, index products uh, because they have the scale with a trillion dollars in that particular index. And they have the IT systems and the trading and the institutional knowledge of 20, 30 years of doing it. There's only five or six firms that could compete with each other on that type of scale. So, you know, you've got to find something else. It's a little bit more. Uh, a, a little bit more niche. And it's something that I know I've enjoyed in listening to your podcast over the years is, is the emphasis on a niche, because I think that is something that uh, every advisor and every advisory firm has to focus on. Um, it's, it's a race to the to scale otherwise. 
And there's only one or two winners in, in that type of space. So you've got to find your own niche and understand that niche better than everyone else does. So, so with that as kind of an overall context and theme that we've kind of set here, uh, like tell us about your actual advisory firm. Like what, what do you uh, do? Tell us about the business. Sure. So Tanager Wealth Management was uh, set up 12 years ago um, with myself and uh, uh, Alex Eichhorn and Jeff Hedges and looking at the challenges of U.S.-U.K. Uh, wealth management. Um, U.S. persons, uh, so U.S. citizens living abroad are taxed by the IRS still. Um, and then you're, of course, taxed in whatever country you might live in, U.K. or Germany or Japan or wherever you might live in. So there is a, an, an interesting intersection of two different tax authorities in this weird Venn diagram uh, where not everything is as it seems because of the interaction between the two. And we realized that there was no one that was serving this space um, very well that had their hands around everything. And we were humble and we knew that we didn't have all the answers on day one, but we were going to, you know, we we're going to die on that hill trying. And uh, 12 years later, I'm, I'm very happy to say that we've probably not solved every problem, but we've found solutions to many problems uh, that a transatlantic lifestyle uh, will, will give you from a financial perspective. And then if there are financial challenges, that then leads into perhaps, you know, just your own social and home challenges of uncertainty. You know, do we have enough to retire, et cetera? These human nature questions uh, aren't answered if you can't figure out the complexity of the financial side uh, of your life. So we, uh, in a nutshell, are regulated in both countries. We have offices in both countries, and we pretty much exclusively work with U.S. connected uh, families in the U.S. or the U.K., although we do have some a, a small smattering of clients across the EU uh, in other countries, um, and we're really, really good at understanding uh, that Venn diagram of the intersection of uh, of two countries uh, fighting over your financial life, and then helping interpret it to an efficient solution for your family, and give you the peace of mind to know that you can do what you'd like to accomplish with your family's goals and objectives. When you say you're the the intersection of two countries fighting over your financial life, uh, it just, it's just can you highlight for us a little bit more? Like, what does that mean? What kinds of issues are are your clients dealing with in this context? Sure. Uh, so one one quick example that comes to mind is uh, if I were in the U.S. and advising a U.S. resident family, you know, you might consider a five two nine plan for for college savings. Uh, pretty pretty standard solution in terms of gaining a small tax edge uh, on the growth of the money you're putting away to pay for your children's college, you know, 10, 18 years later. Fantastic. But what if the other country doesn't recognize uh, the 529 wrapper and they just consider it a brokerage account? Well, now you've kind of lost that tax edge for having this account. So now what you have is an account that pays 30 basis points to the state you've chosen, and you have a limited selection of investment products that may themselves have a slightly higher expense ratio. And maybe that other country, the one that you live in, has in fact uh, decided to levy a penalty on some of the investments inside that account. So you've went from having a tax edge and a pretty, I would say, bog standard type of uh, solution uh, for, your, for your households, for your target clients, to actually potentially being a tax penalty for your, uh, your clients. How do you end up with a penalty in that in that context? Just meaning like they're going to tax it and you're sort of paying the wrapper fees of being tax deferred? Or is there actually like a more punitive version of this? No, there is a punitive version of it. And, and the IRS levies it as well. Um, the IRS version calls it a passive foreign investment company. So if you were to take and invest in, let's say, a UK mutual fund or a European USITS 3 fund or what have you, um, the IRS would look at that and say, well, that's opaque to us. We don't know what they're doing inside of that fund. We don't know if they're just, for example, rolling up all the income and not paying it out. So you're not paying any tax on it. So we're just going to tax all your gains as if they were income. So the penalty is generally some form of you don't get capital gains treatment as, again, a generic example. Uh, the permutations okay. of tax penalties are way too many to discuss in, a, in an hour, um, but that's one simple high level uh, penalty. Okay. So, so I, it works so the I other way. So tax favored vehicle in, in one country that the IRS says, eh, we're not quite sure how it works over there. We're just taxing all the, all the, all the growth is in ordinary income each year and you can get another country that basically does the same thing, same version of our 529 plans to say like, all right, we know how mutual funds and ETFs work. We don't really know how this roll up wrapper multi-layer state thing is. So we're, we're just going to take a whack at it as though it's income every year and you can do it. Exactly. 
that's that's exactly right. So maybe the the other country would say, right, well, we don't know these U.S. mutual funds that are inside of this unusual wrapper. Uh, so we're not going to acknowledge the tax benefits of that wrapper because we're not trying to help pay for UK, you know, U.S. college. We're you know, another country. And furthermore, we don't understand the U.S. investments because they don't report to our tax authority over here. So we're going to treat them all the gains as if it was income. Uh, as, as uh, again, a generic high level example of, of that. So now you're getting taxed at, let's say, 40 percent generically or maybe more, depending on the other country's tax rate, instead of paying no tax. And, and so now you have to start learning, I guess, from the advisor end. I need to know the 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 vehicles on on both countries' sides just to sort of play the local ground game on each side. And I have to know whether those vehicles are or are not recognized on the on the other country side and then I'm not creating a scenario where the the tax benefits of one become tax detriment on the other. Yeah, exactly. Or if not tax detriments, at least highly inefficient. Uh, we see lots of clients come to us with you know well-intentioned uh, portfolios from let's say large wirehouses in the US that might have a slice allocated to municipal bonds, uh, which is not a bad recommendation if you're in a higher bracket and you live in the US and you have you know, appropriate tax deductions or not paying tax on those particular uh, vehicles interest. Fantastic. However, I would tell you that I don't think the UK cares about the sewer system in New York. So you're not going to get the tax break on the interest paid out of that muni bond. So now you're getting an implied lower real rate of interest, right? Because muni bonds generally pay a lower rate of interest than taxable right. bonds. Um, and you're, you're perhaps taking all the illiquidity and credit risk and not getting compensated for it. Um, so you're paying tax and you're probably not getting the right coupon you should have gotten for the same level of fixed income risk. Uh, for that particular investment makes sense so so there's a lot of nuances i guess around everything from country specific investment vehicles or wrappers such as 529 plans or even just down to the the investment characteristics and construction in one country versus another you know my municipal bond is tax exempt here that might be a fine deal if i'm here but if i'm in the uk that doesn't recognize that tax status, now I'm just buying a tax exempt yield that's actually taxable, which is not probably not helping me. Yeah, that's exactly right. So there's there's almost limitless permutations. And like I said, I'd like to think that we've solved many uh, of those permutations for our clients. Um, as many of us at Tanager have, have lived a lot of those permutations and probably uh, you know made the mistake once ourselves in our own personal account. Um, but there's so many that I know we haven't solved them all. Um, there's just too many possible permutation. So we're still working at it, still learning, still changing, still evolving ourselves uh, to, to be able to, to learn all the permutations on, on behalf of our clients. And in fact, the name Tanager is really an homage to Charles Darwin. Um, if you think back to uh, your learnings of Darwin, probably back in high school or whenever you might have uh, heard of him, um, he tra traveled on the HMS Beagle and into the Galapagos with uh, some samples of finches that were there with different beak sizes, one to pick worms out of the ground and one to crack nuts and one to eat fruit, et cetera. Uh, when he came back, uh, you know, they were called Darwin's finches. Well, if you fast forward 150 years or so, uh, the ornithological community said, well, actually they're not finches. Half of these birds fall into a different uh, classification in the animal kingdom. And I, I will give you one guess what that classification is called. Uh, they're tanagers actually. So Darwin is an inspiration because he was very scientific in his approach. He was always learning. He was willing to challenge some of the orthodoxy of, of the time, but also enough to keep us humble that we don't actually know everything right now. <laughs> We're trying to evolve ourselves and we'll probably be better at all of this tomorrow than we are today, but we're going to keep trying. Interesting. I love the metaphor. I love the business metaphor. So so help us understand the, the scope and size of the business overall. I don't know if you, you measure by clients or revenue or if, if assets or management is a relevant metric in a, in a, in a cross-border context. How do we understand the size and scope of what you're doing? Absolutely. So the firm currently is around $1.1 billion of AUM. Um, in 12 years, I guess, 12 years ago, we started with zero clients and, and hence zero AUM. Um, we have around 630 households uh, overall. So our average client is slightly less than $2 million. Um, it works out to be around 1.3 million pounds. Um, our brains are always confused and switching between dollars and pounds regularly. Uh, we have about 38 team members, of which seven are partners. Um, and I would say that we we operate in a business model that I think most of your listeners would recognize as a you know a fiduciary fee-based RIA. 
Uh, we have a you know, percent of AUM model uh, for charging. Uh, we don't have any commissions in the business. We're not a hybrid. We don't do insurance or mortgages or any of the, I guess, traditional commission type products. Uh, we purely have the financial planning and investment management and, you know, the ancillary services that hang off of that, uh, such as, you know, introductions to accountants and estate planning attorneys uh, and, you know, cash management and, and things of that nature uh, for, you know, an asset-based fee. And and what does that fee structure look like? Or, you know, the, in the U.S., we often talk about the proverbial 1% on a million style fee is the as the go-to benchmark, is that still what it looks like there or is it lower or is it higher? I don't know what um, fee structure looks like on, on, on the UK side. Yeah. So we've modeled ourselves on, again, the, the traditional fee-based fiduciary RAA model in the U S uh, that again, yourself and, and I would imagine all of your listeners are very familiar with um, the model in the UK is slightly different. There still are some embedded commissions. There are still uh, much higher fees uh, than what we're charging for what we're doing. And we eschewed that in thinking that was not long for this world, that it will change over time. And it's better to already be there as opposed to uh, going and trying to change your business model in year 10 and then change it again in year 15 and then explain to clients in year 20 why you had to go change it again and um, right. you know apologize for the prior 20 years. We said, right, well, let's just start with the fiduciary premise. We know we're doing the right thing for clients. We know we don't have any conflicts in the business of you know recommending this fund or that insurance product etc over another because the commission might be slightly higher or lower etc 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 um and so we really modeled ourselves on on those uh, fee-based ras from the us uh, that i had worked with in, in prior jobs and so and so how does the aum fee schedule work there uh, so roughly speaking yeah there's a, a lower tier below a million that's one and a quarter percent uh, then there's a tier up to 3 million, that's 1%. Uh, and then from 3 to 10 is 75 basis points. And above 10 is 50 basis points. Um, and we don't do first and then next. We tend to just say, right, oh, you have $2 million, that's 1%. So multiply the two, bill it quarterly, okay, so it's like divide not, it by four. Not, the, not like the incremental graduated 1.25% on X plus 1% on the next dollar amounts after the first the first segment, it's just like a cliff. Like if you're in this zone, this is the fee on the whole thing. Exactly. Um, you know, initially when we were setting it up, we just thought, well, it would just be easier to calculate <laughs> to do the fees. Quite honestly, we could just see your AOM on a spreadsheet or on our screen, and then we could mentally just know which bracket that was and multiply the two, and we could get to what uh, the the expected fee uh, or revenue was. Um, yeah, in hindsight, sure, maybe we could have eked out an extra two or three basis points by doing the graduated bit, um, but it's fine. It all works out. I guess I'm just wondering, do do then you have to deal with the the problem that can crop up or like the 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 client's asset base grows a little bigger, they cross a threshold and, and now like they get a little bigger and you, you end up going backwards slightly on the <laughs> because they hit the new break point. Yeah, it does happen. If you graph it, it looks a bit like a sawtooth. I guess, you know, on, on, a, on a saw. Uh, so, but that's fine. You know, that just means that the client's assets have grown or they've trusted us with more of their, their AUM. Um, you know, these are all positive directions. And again, um, worrying about the last two or three basis points is, is not what we're here for. Um, it's probably not the best business decision, but uh, we've been fortunate and blessed to be growing uh, quite well and quite fast. That going back and trying to claw back that last two or three basis points has not been the, the next biggest priority for us uh, in our journey. And do you ever get problems the other direction? You know, the markets are down, they like get bumped up to the next higher cliff or, is, or, or do you like lock them in if they get to the <laughs> kind of thing? No, we don't operate a high water mark. Um, and, and certainly uh, the year 2022 was an Annus Horribilis for, for most people who were investors. Um, so that conversation did come up a few times. And we did point out that in fact, most other firms in our industry wouldn't have given you the whole break point you know, that you enjoyed last year. So uh, yes, it is going back a bit and you maybe paid a slightly higher fee, um, but uh, you know, you wouldn't have had that break in the, to begin with if we had done the traditional route, as, as you mentioned, the first and then the next and then the next uh, tiering. Okay. So that, that seems, that seems fair. Like, look, we, we, we gave you the benefit of this version for all the years that you're growing. So like, I'm sorry, but that means you do have to have the slightly adverse version for the year that the, that the yeah. markets got pulled back. You're still doing way better than you would have otherwise. Any, any questions? Exactly. That's exactly right. So 
so how do you understand the the structure of this 38 person team this that's a that's a that's a lot of people <laughs> there's a lot of people doing stuff it is it's a lot of people it's a lot of people and um it's the breakdown of the team has become evident by the necessity of what we need everyone to do. Um, so there's 11 advisors in the 38 uh, team members currently. Uh, there's also 10 planners. So we do differentiate between advisors and planners. Um, there are six people in the investment team. Uh, there are six client service people. And then there's five kind of centralized support, whether it's marketing or operational or um, what have you. Um, so that roughly is the 38. And the real challenge is that we're because we can't just go on LinkedIn and hire someone that knows the job because right. really almost no one does US UK wealth management and works with, you know, Pershing USA and potentially Pershing UK or, you know, a UK custodian, we end up having to teach a lot of people the job. So we need to build in a, a good deep pool of talent, which we're very fortunate to have have groomed and built and, and taught and trained and and uh, gotten to where we are today by by doing that. Um that we need to make sure that we're we're always have enough staff to do the job that needs to be done, um, but also to teach and train the next generation that might be coming through in another three or six months when we hire the next person. Um, and then there's also the challenge of having multiple regulators. <clears throat> you know, we're, we're regulated by the SEC in the US, but then we're also regulated by the FCA in the UK. And that means that there's two layers of regulations. So it's not just looking at, you know, whatever the new DOL uh, rule is, you know, pertaining to ERISA or rollovers or whatever it might be. There might also be an FCA rule about UK pensions and how you change those and how that changes every three years, it seems. Um, so we have to actually write much, much longer recommendation letters um, than would be standard if we only had one or the other regulator, which then means you need a lot more planners to kind of crunch more plans and, and write more suitability letters, as it's called in, in FCA parlance. Um, so we're probably staffed heavier than your standard RAA in the US of a comparable size with households and, and AOM potentially. Um, but it's a necessity from how we need to uh, build and grow and constantly tackle new challenges that no one else knows the answers to. And then also uh, making sure that we're compliant with at least two regulators. So, so talk to us a little bit more about this distinction between advisors and and planners or even advisors and planners and investments a lot of those can get mashed together for firms they absolutely can and and, and there's certainly many ways to skin a cat as the old saying goes um, so advisors are really challenged and tasked with you know converting the leads that we're generating as a firm as well as generating their own leads of course and, and turning them into clients and doing the the full suite of relationship management uh, I guess processes and and whatnot that you that you're familiar with and all of your listeners are familiar with the planning team um, are a, a repository for a lot of the great knowledge that the advisors almost universally have themselves um, of, you know, what is the right solution to apply in this particular client circumstance, uh, you know, whether it's an, a, a grandparent's gift for a chill, child or um, <clears throat> general saving for a house down payment in a year or you know, whatever the, the goals might be of the of the particular household. And understanding, of course, then, oh, this is a U.S. person living here and this is, let's say, not a U.S. person. So we have a lot of clients uh, or you know, our spouses of clients who are, are not U.S. citizens. So you almost need an entirely different solution for them that's just compliant with local uh, laws, regulation and taxation. And so the planners are a great team that's a repository for that knowledge and support the advisors in getting out the advice and helping to plan uh, what needs to be you know, produced for the individual clients based upon a lot of the advisors interactions with them. Um, I would say. A lot of the advisors have CFP designations themselves, so certainly they know this information. Um, they're not ignorant to it, but just the responsibility of relationship management and managing a book of clients um, is a full-time job in and of itself. And sometimes you do need help. You do need planners to actually help, you know, write the plans and and help suggest ideas for solutions uh, for client households. So that's kind so of the division. And a lot of our planners may graduate to become advisors if that's the direction they choose to take. Um, so they could eventually be advisors themselves. So uh, do the do the planning team folks have any client facing responsibilities in this context, or is the role very focused in in sort of the behind the scenes 
So the planning team themselves do not have client facing responsibilities, um, but they will join the advisors in meetings, you know, a fact find meeting or annual review or uh, a catch up one. Oh, we, we had some questions about how to what you ex exactly meant by this. And we have two or three different paths. Let's just bounce ideas off of you. But they don't have the responsibility of client facing. So I would say the advisors are the ones who are responsible for that client facing uh, management and, and keeping in touch and, and ensuring that uh, you know a client's needs are being met and, and gathering that information that's, um, that's required uh, to create uh, the appropriate recommendation. As I said though a second ago, a lot of our, many of our advisors were also planners to start with. Um, and since we can't just go, if you will, hire off the shelf for almost right. any of our positions, um, it's a good training to say, okay, well, here's the US rules. If we hire, let's say a UK person who's had some experience in the UK industry, here's the US rules that you need to overlay into that new Venn diagram in your brain. And if we hire a US person who maybe moved over to the UK or was a trailing spouse and their spouse moved over here for a job or what have you, and we're training them on the UK side of things. So here's the UK half of the Venn diagram. You've got to lay on your existing US knowledge. And then again, several of those planners do you know, graduate into becoming advisors if, if that's what they like to do. So how, from a, like a slightly more practical level, how literally do 10 planners stay coordinated with 11 advisors? Meaning, is this like a, a team environment? Every advisor has an assigned planner or like planners assigned to this 50 clients are your clients that you provide support on across multiple advisors? Are they just a shared resource? Whoever, you know, whoever grabs the next question off the queue answers it. Like how, how do you actually manage the, the coordination with this sort of separation division of labor? Yeah, we, we don't operate a pod structure. Um, we decided that it would be better to have a matrix again for the learning and sharing of, of knowledge and processes and reinforcing that that base knowledge that's needed to be creative to solve the next problem we don't know the answer to. So the planners will generally be assigned to client households, you know, alongside, of course, the main advisor, but they're not one for one with all the advisor's clients. So, you know, planner A might have 10 clients in common uh, with, you know, advisor one, but then planner A also has 10 clients with advisor two. And so the planners get in their own development and career progression get to see different uh, styles and different um, abilities and capabilities and understand what maybe the best practices are. Because a lot of the challenge of being an advisor in my mind is understanding how to relate to the person across the table from you or people across the table from you. You know, on day one, the, the prospects don't, don't know you at all. And they, maybe they've been hurt before by a prior advisor who was slightly less scrupulous or less of a fiduciary. And you have to know to, how to kind of see the, the human behavioral signals and relate to them. You know, if you have a, let's say, generically a software engineer type client, an engineer mindset sitting across from you, you know, maybe don't talk about the weather and the flowers all day long and sports teams. They probably want to dive right into how you're going to solve the, the dual U.S. Uh, and other country tax problems they have that they haven't quite been able to figure out yet themselves, or why they can't open a U.S. brokerage account because they don't have a U.S. address anymore. They want to perhaps dive, dive right into that. And then generically, maybe there is someone who's not an engineer mindset, and maybe they want to build that rapport first. And if the planner only works with an engineer advisor, then they're not going to see the other side of it. Or if they only work with uh, an advisor who's better at the softer skills, then they're not going to see the engineer, you know, sale process or relationship building process. So we've been intentional in creating a matrix of how the planners and advisors work together and coordinate for the common clients, but not have a dedicated one for one uh, relationship. So how do you handle just think like the proverbial, uh, you know, multi-headed boss phenomenon, or like I'm a, I'm a planner and advisor number one, advisor number two, both come to me like, I got big client meetings tomorrow morning. I need, I need you to, to wrap up this analysis. I'm like, I can't do both of your things. At the same time. <laughs> you both have a meeting tomorrow. Uh, I just, I, I, you know, if I just, those challenges often crop up in, in sort of matrix style um, yeah. uh, systems. So how, how do you guys handle, handle that when you've got this planner shared resource approach? So we do have a partner who's in charge of uh, the planning team, and we also have a partner who's in charge of the advisor team. So in terms of, you know, let's say doing year-end reviews or KPIs or, or you know, 
uh, gauging how someone has progressed or, or not progressed throughout the year, you know, there is a dedicated manager at the partner level who's looking at each of the teams and they are soliciting feedback, you know, on how, uh, let's say each of the team members has, uh, has, has fulfilled their KPIs or not fulfilled their KPIs or uh, what growth is needed in what areas or um, suggestions for improvement or even praise, you know, this is what this person does great, keep doing more of that. Um, you know, and that's how promotions happen as well, is, is when there's um, nothing left to work, at, work on at that level, um, then maybe you're ready for the next level that you want to achieve. Um, so really, it comes down to understanding, okay, I do have a manager, I'm a planner, I have a manager, or I'm an advisor, and I have a manager, and I need to, you know, work well together with the, the member of the other side of, uh, of the team. Um, but ultimately, there is, you know, a partner in charge of each group uh, to control the uh, the interactions and to make sure that everything is accomplished for the benefit of the client. And and what do you know, what kind of KPIs do you measure in the context of, of planners? In advisors, we're usually looking at uh, you know, uh, revenue growth, new business brought in, client retention. I feel like there's some, some fairly typical metrics on that end. But when you've separated out the planners, like what are their KPIs? Like how do you actually evaluate them? Yeah, well, I will say straight off that I am not the partner in charge of all the planners. So this is not my day-to-day -day job in, ter in terms of uh, managing the planning team and, and their KPIs. But I do know that they're judged on, you know, again, just like any team member of any uh, business, you know, growth from A to B, beginning of the year to end of year. Uh, these are the goals we set out for you. We wanted you to take charge of writing um, letters of authority to clients' pre-existing pension plans. Great. You tackled that. You built a better process. You've improved upon how we did that. And you've you've learned how to interact. That built, you know, a few blocks of knowledge with the pension community. So now you're, uh, you know, one level smarter than you were last year on pensions. Maybe this year you look at how to tear apart the pension structures and understand, uh, you know, all the different technical details of uh, the structure and the fees and the, the rights of the member, you know, can, how do they take money out and what can they invest in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and understand how, you know, that shapes the recommendation that we're ultimately going to make. Um, so the planners are really judged on, you know, how they're growing and progressing and building their own knowledge, as well as, you know, contributing to the common culture of, of the company. Um, and beyond that, I would have to defer to my partner who, who is in charge of the planning team. And, and how long are like how long does it take someone being a planner before they're able to to move in the direction of becoming an advisor? Do you know it's like is there a standard career track or is it uh so, you know, specific to the individual about just how they're how they're progressing whether they even want to go that direction? Well, I would say it is specific to the individual. We have had uh, some people that came across and and were advisors previously in the U.S. Uh, we had one person who joined us from. Uh, one of the big wirehouses and had you know fantastic experience over over several right. years and had moved here uh, and gotten married and has started a family etc um, but didn't at the time know much of the uk interaction so it was really a function of okay well there are some gaps in your knowledge you probably would be okay with the relationship management you're probably you know, good with the the us knowledge uh, given where you had come from and what you had been doing previously but we're going to assume that you know zero about the uk and the uk interaction with the us so maybe you need to do a year you know, tour of duty just to pick up as much technical knowledge as you can on the other side of the pond. And once you've done that, you know, along the way with lots of check-ins and, uh, you know, support and, and ensuring that you're on the right path, then you can be an advisor because you had already been one in the U S. So, you know, that's one example of a person that's come through and their, their time was probably a year. It might've been a month less. I, I don't remember exactly, but it was around about a year that they spent on the planning team just to pick up that UK side of knowledge. And then others, you know, this is a good career path in and of itself. Um, I, I would say that, you know, being a planner and working on the technical uh, side of, of planning knowledge is a fantastic career path in and of itself. And it's not a place that, uh, you know, you're ever going to be bored with. <laughs> I guarantee you something will change tomorrow and you don't know it. So you get a chance to learn and solve a new Rubik's Cube every year. Um, so we do have some people that are uh, on that path of probably being planners. And, and that's great also. Um, on average, I would say, yeah, it's probably one to three years, maybe two to three years of time in the planning team. Um, but a lot of that is also determined by their experience before they came to us. And it's going to help us understand a little bit more just how, how you how you teach all all of this, right? Like how how do you how do you teach a lot of stuff that may not have a standard 
a standard textbook or curriculum. And I don't know if there is a, a, a UK equivalent of the CFP designation and you can give them some structured learning, uh, like just share with us a little bit more how, how, like how you create this as a learning path when you're trying to do this for, as you know, like multiple advisors over time systematically because you're a growing firm and it's basically impossible to hire anyone who actually has this knowledge and experience pre-existing. <laughs> yeah, I would say that that's part of our secret sauce is, is ensuring that you, you know, hire fantastic people um, that are, are both, you know, knowledgeable and intelligent and hardworking, but also selfless and able to teach the next person who, who comes, you know, behind them, through the door behind them. Um, it is tough teaching. It is a large, uh, a large piece of what we focus on in thinking about the direction of the firm is ensuring that we have the, the processes and the building blocks in place that we can teach the next person we hire because we you know, just keep hiring. We're, we're blessed again to be growing. So uh, we're always looking to hire uh, another person uh, to fill in the gaps here or there or, or, um, or whatnot. So we do have an internal, I guess, tool uh, where we, you know, post our own, I guess, wiki, if you will, with videos and, and kind of an internal blog um, that lays out procedures and how to do something or explains, you know, what an UTMA is uh, to someone who maybe had worked in the UK previously and has never heard the phrase UTMA. So this is right. what an UTMA is. And this is how it's similar to this particular, let's say, UK construct, you know, of a, of a kid's brokerage account. Fantastic. Um, we so also have it as part of the KPIs that you are, you know, responsible for, you know, participating and teaching the person sitting next to you. Um, we encourage, you know, lunch and learns. Why don't you write up a topic on uh, how U.S. insurance interacts with U.K. taxation and whether that life insurance trust works for U.K. Um, you know, legal frameworks that the client lives in, and do a half-hour lunch and learn. Fantastic. Teach all of us about this. I don't, I don't know the answer. Um, great. You get a you know a bonus point for doing that, so that is encouraged and part of the culture. Interesting, interesting. And so I'm just envisioning now that you've been doing this more than a decade. There's just this very sizable, ever growing, ever refining internal wiki of articles and videos and explainers that that you all have created for yourself that then becomes part of your teaching manual. <laughs> We're, we're actively building that out every day. Um, a lot of it is still in the heads of, of the partners and the people who've been here for you know, 10, 12 years, um, but we're actively trying to get that down on paper or, or into the ether um, such that it's more of a permanent repository of knowledge uh, so that we can train the next person and, and the next staff member and team member that, that joins us. Um, so it, it, I wish it was all written down and in the repository, but we're, we're getting there. We're, we're putting the pieces in place. And... Uh... And, and where do you draw the line just when you're getting this far into I think like a lot of these cross-border tax issues that you were describing in particular and you know, how's a how's a 529 plan get uh, get taxed in the UK you know is this uh, euro vehicle going to be a PFIC to the to the IRS uh, like where do you draw the line between being financial advisors that know and are savvy on tax things versus being accountants doing the tax work more directly i mean do you, do you actually do that as well or do you is there still some point where you say you this is beyond us uh you need to go out to a, to a tax attorney absolutely no that's a great question and and we come across that that line all the time um so we are not accountants we do not do clients tax returns we're not qualified to do uh, tax returns. Uh, we work with a lot of great partners, probably 70 or 80 you know, accountants in particular that are good at US, UK cross-border tax. So that's that's fantastic. Um, and yeah, you just have to know where that line is of saying, well, this is what we've seen before. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there, there's a lot of gray areas as well. So we do have to be careful not to, to step on a landmine and say something that might be taken as you know tax advice when we're not tax advisors uh, but say wait well this is what we've seen you know in, in 10 out of 10 uh, client cases uh, this is how it's been interpreted so this is broadly the rule let's have a meeting with your accountant you know nowadays with um, with video calls it's generally pretty easy to set up a, a phone call much quicker than it had been pre-covid right. if there's any good good to come out of covid it was probably the the acceptance of video calls <laughs> That now we can just snap, have a, a video call, and, and 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 talk about something with you know an accountant or a lawyer and the clients in the room, et cetera. Uh, no matter where we all are, and so that is a, a key thing though is to just know where that line is and say, right, 
we think this is the right answer. And this is generally how 529 plans, for example, have been interpreted. But there are dissenting opinions on that as well. And you know, here's the dissenting uh, argument of that. And we won't make that determination for you. Uh, let's talk to the person who's going to sign the bottom of your tax return and right. say that they prepared it. And let's ask what their opinion is. But here are the two opinions. And then here's the, the path traveled after each of those two opinions. So then we know what the decision will be once the, 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 the actual decision is made of it. Does it do A or B? We know what to do after that. So, so take us along this growth journey. You said you, you launched about 12 years ago, basically starting with no clients and, and no assets. Now you're, you're north of a billion dollars. So, uh, so help us understand just how this growth has worked, where these clients have come from. Is, is this all you know, organically one at a time? Were there mergers and acquisitions along the way? Like what, what was this decade-long path to a billion? Yeah, we started with zero clients. Um, there, there was no no clients uh, on day one, and uh, not many clients on day two. <laughs> um, as I'm sure any of your, uh, your your followers would know, if they've set up their own RAA, uh, not having had one previously, you know, at a wirehouse to to, to carve out. Um, I would say that the journey has been really, really interesting and uh, and, and a growth opportunity for everyone that's been on the bus uh, taking this journey. It's, there are days when it's certainly hard and challenging, and there are days when it's exhilarating and, and amazing. Um, there's not too much that would be different, I would say, than a standard RAA in terms of how the business has found clients. Um, you know, we talk to accountants and estate planning attorneys, and uh, we talk to people who do insurance and mortgages and get referrals from all of those professionals in the, in the same sphere uh, of, of, you know, cross-border wealth management uh, uh, professions. Is so, that mostly is that mostly talking to folks? Or it's even where are you guys primarily based? Is this mostly in the U.S. and you're picking up the folks that know about the U.K. or is this mostly in the U.K. and you're picking up folks that know about the U.S. or are like stationed in the station in the U.K. from the U.S. So currently, uh, 36 of our 38 uh, team members are are in London, and two are in Philadelphia. And we're growing the Philadelphia office. We've seen you know fantastic output and and growth and demand for that. So we're we're hiring someone else currently and and uh, you know going to keep growing our u s. presence you know on the ground in the u s. Um, but most of the team are in London, and that's probably going to be the case for for some for the foreseeable future. Um, so we're we're talking to people. there are there is again a, a niche of accountants and lawyers and insurance uh, professionals and mortgage professionals that work with uh, you know u s. expats. So we you know, network and, and work within the same uh, realm as, as, again, someone in New York might do, uh, looking for clients in New York City. So, uh, you, you talk so to your local accountants and lawyers. Set, proverbial centers of influence, yeah, uh, uh, kind of marketing, but it's UK accounts and attorneys and insurance and mortgage folks who work in that expat space uh, uh, already, that, that that becomes your go-to. Exactly. Although I'd say it hasn't always been this way. I would say that the the one thing about our growth trajectory, which um, which which you might be familiar with, having been in the industry yourself for some time, is you know you have to mirror your business. Uh, on, on day one, the big four is, doesn't want to talk to you. You, you. You'd be lucky to get coffee with them. On day one, you know they just yeah they have other people to refer to and get referrals from, and you're just a person with a laptop and a you know a mobile phone. So you're probably not getting you know big four referrals on day one. So maybe you need to go meet all the independent accountants in the space. You know who who's around the corner uh, that that has a CPA after their name. Uh, maybe you need to go meet all the attorneys who have just left a big firm and set up their own shop. And you know you're all the same size. All of you have set up just recently or have only been in business a couple of years. Uh, you guys should build your own network and and refer to each other and lean on each other. You know through the good and the bad of of setting up a an entrepreneurial endeavor such as this. And then fast forward ten years. Maybe you are big enough. Maybe just through going to you know industry events and networking and webinars and seminars and, and all of that, that maybe in year ten, you know the big four know who you are, and in fact you can get referrals from them. Certainly, you still nurture and you still love all the people who have been on the journey with you. Um, and now there's just more people in the bus uh, to get that you know chance for an opportunity uh, to to take a referral and, and improve someone's financial life. Um, but the mirroring is very important. And I think it's, it's something that we had to learn early on was uh, getting a lot of doors closed in our face 
because well, who were we? You know, we, we had no clients on day one. Um, but again, 10 years later, uh, you're probably known at that point if you've lasted 10 years and, and had some success. Um, so that that mirroring is, is very important. And and certainly I still value and, and treasure all the relationships across the independent space uh, of people we met along the way. And they're some of my best friends and uh, still great professional contacts to this day. I like that framing that the sort of mirroring concept. Look, if you just, if you just hung your shingle and you're going out as an independent, go find other people in your related professions of attorney, uh, 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 accountants and attorneys or, or whatever that space is for you. Like go find those versions of people who also just went out on their own and hung their own shingle because they probably don't have a lot of pre-existing relationships. They're at a similar stage in relatability of their business to where, to where you are. I guess the bad news is they may not have as many clients literally because they're getting going as well. But the good news is again, they don't they don't have pre-existing relationships. They maybe even be more invested into yours because you're both at a stage where if I give you two clients and you give me two clients, that was really meaningful for both of us. Yeah. <laughs> That's absolutely. a big deal in the first year or two. Absolutely. And you know, even the the prospect calls that you might have and you say, oh right, this person came to me, uh, you know, they have $10,000 to invest or something. They're not quite ready or, or really need the full wealth management service. They probably need some a pat on the back and they probably need some guidance and a, you know, a torch through the woods to see the path. But what they really need is an accountant. They really need someone to do both taxes for them in, in the US and, and the other country. So actually, even though you can't take that person on or that family on at this moment as a client because they're not quite the right fit, uh, for where they are and, and for the services you provide, they might be a great fit for that accountant or that lawyer. You know, maybe uh, they, uh, the prospect just graduated from grad school and got married and had a kid and bought a house. So the assets are quite light um, and the plan is quite simple, you know, work more and, and raise the family. And they might, however, want an estate plan now that they have a child. So maybe that's really, really important to refer them on to a lawyer to help write, you know, the, the what if scenario document. Uh, maybe they need someone to just do their taxes for them because, you know, they have a, a new child and they're working and peddling as fast as they can at their job or jobs. And they don't have time to figure out taxes for two countries. That's a great referral to, you know, the accountant. And then they probably will come back to you, you know, three years later after they've settled a bit in the new life environment that they've found. But you've earned a lot of goodwill in those two or three years with the accountant and the lawyer referred them to and with the prospect because they really needed and wanted those services at that moment in time and maybe didn't need or want your service at that moment in time. So I guess I'm wondering that in that context, what like what's the actual strategy or I guess the actual tactics of how did you like get these doors open and and build and develop these cross referral relationships? I feel like a lot of advisors struggle with cross referral relationships and feel like they send out a lot more than they get back from a lot of <laughs> attorneys and, 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 and accountants out there. So how did you all go about building these relationships and, and really turning them into mutually beneficial relationships? Cause it sounds like your, your referral flows are a lot more bi-directional than, than a lot of advisors seem to seem to get with this strategy. Well, it certainly does take time. Um, I will say that. And it's not the only path. Uh, referrals are fantastic, both from you know, external professionals in your network, as well as, of course, from clients, which is, is the ultimate um, compliment is to have a referral from, from an existing client that you've done a good job. And here, here's my friend who's in a similar position. Um, so we have done lots of webinars and marketing. And, and prior to COVID, we did seemingly endless seminars uh, and, and just really talked to anyone that would have us. We'd speak at any events that was, you know, of interest to us uk uh, transatlantic families um, so, so webinars and seminars wasn't out to other centers of of influence that was that was like you all trying to reach expats more directly yeah, we would do both but a lot of it was you know us directly um, maybe working through let's say an alumni club you know of, of this particular university has a branch in london and so go speak at their event and, and sponsor the drinks and you know, the, the canapes and, you know, you get 30 minutes to say what you do, um, shake some hands, have a, have a drink and, and socialize and, you know, maybe talk about baseball. You don't necessarily have to talk about finance all the time uh, with these people. It is also about building relationships and, and enjoying the journey. Um, so we did lots and lots of seminars, uh, certainly pre COVID and then they're starting to pick back up now. Uh, but pre COVID there were lots and lots of seminars. So it's not just professional networking. There is kind of a, a direct to consumer 
uh, if you will, angle uh, to this. And, you know, there, there's no two ways around it. You know, building an RA business is, um, is a lot of, of shoe leather. You, you just have to get out there. Uh, you won't find an accountant or lawyer that will just give you 20 clients and, and jumpstart you. That's probably not going to happen for most people. Um, bless you if it did. That's great. Uh, but it didn't for us. So as you tried all these channels, what what ultimately proved to be the biggest the biggest driver for outcomes? I mean, just a, a billion dollars in 12 years is a lot of client movement. So what what worked? What What gained traction and caught fire for you? It was uh, horses for courses. At different stages, different things worked. Um, on day one, uh, there was a lot of um, you know search engine optimization and looking through uh, LinkedIn ads uh, as they had existed you know 10, 12 years ago. Um, you know through professionals that would see those ads and, and targeted advertising that way. Uh, that was a high impact. Although oh, interesting L- LinkedIn ads, because I guess expatriate location London is actually the kind of thing you write in your LinkedIn profile. So you could, you could very specifically target on LinkedIn, like you're a business professional with the right title in the right city with an expat label in your, in your profile and get, get quite targeted to them. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was very good early on. It was, um, it's tapered off quite a lot. It's not quite as effective um, as this is a lot more advertising on LinkedIn now than there used to be. Um, back then, so our, our ROI on that spend has has plummeted um, from from what it had been. Um, but there's still a lot in, in you know search engine optimization and uh, getting keywords out there. You know, if, uh, if if someone in in the United Kingdom is searching for the term PFIC or passive foreign investment company, chances are they're an American. Uh, why would anyone Google that term? That's, right. that's specific to U.S. tax, and it probably means that an hour ago your accountant told you you had some. And it's a tax penalty. <laughs> right. So you went home and you Googled it and said, oh, my God, it is a thing. And maybe our name popped up uh, when you did that uh, as okay. someone providing solutions um, for that. Right. That so just take that. take something your your very narrow target market might might be Googling for and make sure that they find you there because that's a, a very esoteric topic and very well targeted. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, you, you, you start with some of those uh, and then you, of course, networking with like-minded independents in, in the niche and just really, you know, lots of shoe leather, lots of, of getting out there and, and spreading the word and, you know, asking for the opportunity uh, to help improve someone's life. Because again, we might not know the answers on day one, but 12 years down the road, we've built a big library of answers. And it's all through you know, the hard work of the team members and, and getting out there and trying to find uh, the next family we can help and the next solution that we can solve. And it sounds like from your description of advisors earlier that business development has become fairly distributed for you a- across the firm. So it's not, it's not just centralized marketing or founder expectations. Any, anyone who's in an advisor seat has some business development expectations. Uh, certainly, yeah, there is um, an expectation of business development. Um, I would say that it's we're again lucky and blessed that we've had enough uh, organic growth of, of demand for our services. There aren't, um, th- there's not many uh, firms that do what we do, and, and certainly not many that do it for as long as we have done it and, and with the scale that we are doing it on. Um, so, the the business does come to us, um, but we don't want to get lazy. You know, we do have to still get out there and attend events and, and shake hands and build relationships and, and network and ensure that we're still, uh, you know, generating that business. So there are targets and, and KPIs uh, for business development. Can Can you share a little bit more there? Just what what kinds of expectations you you have? It sounds like your advisors also have a pretty pretty healthy client relationship management load as well. So how do you think about like what are reasonable expectations and capacity between business development and how many clients you can handle? Uh, that's, that is the eternal question. You know, if oh. I had the, if I had the answer for that at a hundred percent certainty, um, I, I would be a very, very wealthy man. Um, we generally target, you know, on the order of 75 households per advisor as a, as a good number. And, and some of our advisors are over that and, and, and many of them are under that. Um, but that's a good target of saying, right, you can provide a meaningful service to 75 households, given the infrastructure that we have around you from the investment team to the, the planners, to the client service team, to the centralized support, 
uh, and the software and fantastic technology we use and the custody partners, you can generally have 75 households and, and manage them pretty well and have a, a pretty good standard of living for yourself. So if you're over that, then maybe your business development goals are are less uh less emphasized and it's more about client retention and perhaps uh you know seeding the next advisor to come along with three or four of your clients um, that that you find is suitable to hand off to them um, whereas if you have zero clients then yes there's absolutely a business development right. uh, discussion to be had you have zero clients and uh, you don't want to have zero clients we don't want you to have zero clients. So here's some leads, uh, here's some seminars to attend, here's some webinars to speak at and be the lead speaker or the guest speaker on these webinars that we're running. Um, and then you know, hopefully generate some interest on the back of that. Um, so again, the goals will be different depending on what stage of, of their own business development that each of the advisors is in. Um, but I would say that if you can have, you know, 10, $15 million of net new assets in a year, that's a, that's a pretty good year uh, for most advisors generically. Uh, we've certainly had advisors do a lot better than that in any given year. And we've had you know, some years where that doesn't get achieved, um, but that's a, a good benchmark. Okay. And, and again, I think you said earlier, your average client household is a little under 2 million uh, of assets. Obviously average is average. There's a range around that. Uh, but I, I, if I'm, if I'm thinking about that properly, then it's so like an advisor's 75 client household capacity might be like 140 to 150 million dollar uh, uh, asset base, and if they're bringing in 10 to 15 million dollars of net new assets, you're, you're kind of talking about like half a dozen new clients, give or give or take a little in a, yeah. in a particular year. Am I am I like anchoring those yeah. numbers properly? That's about right. Um, this is one of the instances where, where at least my brain switches back to pounds, and I think 100 million pounds, which is around 125 million dollars. Okay. Uh, current, currently at today's FX rate is is a reasonable book of business for you know a mature advisor uh, who's done well and, and certainly again you can do more than that uh, that's fine you can have less than that that's that's not terrible either but 100 million pounds is a good rule of thumb of of what an advisor's book could be um, with 75 clients and and have a good lifestyle um, as well as you know um, a, a meaningful uh, professional life. Um, that will, uh, generally get satisfied after, you know, six or seven years of, of that type of growth with some market movement as well. Um, so it's not unheard of in our, in our business for an advisor to go from zero to, you know, full in, in five or six, seven years. Um, and that's why, again, uh, we emphasize teaching, learning, uh, knowledge repository and, and bringing through new talent, um, to, to make sure that we have a pipeline of talent that's there and able to, to be the next person up. Right. 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 So, so I'm curious as well with, with so much of the, it sounds like the engagement, it's, it's often like a, a tax or a legal issue that, 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 you know, sparks someone saying, Oh, I, I probably need more professional advice for this job that shift me, shift, shift me overseas. Uh, do you ever think about bringing more of the tax and legal internal then and making that part of the, the breadth of services at Tanager? Uh, we've certainly thought about it, but I don't know, at least at this stage, if we're ever going to consider it seriously as something to, to insource. Uh, I find it's probably better to outsource it because of the specialized knowledge and niche expertise that's required to do the taxes for two countries and understand the tax compliance, let alone tax advice, you know, proactive advisory work or one tax as an example, and the same exact discussion around estate planning. Um, again, it's not to say that we don't understand estate planning. We don't understand tax. We certainly have a good handle on it. Um, but I would not want anyone, you know, currently on the team to go fill out a client's tax return or write their will for them. So. So what what was your path to, to to going this route in the first place? I I, uh, I don't I don't talk to very many advisors. Sort of wake up one morning, I'm like, hmm, US UK <laughs> expats seems like a great place to to build a business. Yeah, well, it was very personal to me. Um, is is I had worked at iShares for um, about ten years, both in in San Francisco and in London. And uh, as we were um, bought by BlackRock from the, the prior firm called Barclays Global Investors, um, I really looked around and just had a, a good bit of soul searching to understand if I wanted to you know, stay in the ETF space. I had done it for 10 years, uh, plus a year or two prior at a, at a data provider firm, um, and understand if I, you know, maybe that was the right time uh, to, to change tact. 
And so I did a hard, you know, self-assessment of what I knew. Well, I thought I knew investing. I thought after beating my head against the wall and, and receiving some well-intentioned, but perhaps incorrect advice on, um, you know, US, UK tax and financial planning from you know, people I sat next to or friends or what have you, um, that I knew a little bit about how to be an expat and what the investment and tax and planning challenges were. Uh, okay, be, for because some, you were actually placed in the UK with Barclays yeah. as part of this. Okay. Yeah, I was in London as, as the takeover happened in, in 2009, 2010. Okay. And I said, well, I don't know if I want to do ETFs anymore. I, I, I think I decided I don't. I just wasn't energized um, by working in the ETF industry anymore, having spent 10 years doing it um, and working with some fantastic people that have really went out and seeded the rest of the ETF industry. You know, whether it was Goldman's ETFs or JP Morgan's ETFs or Bond Blocks ETFs, you know, there's, there's iShares alumni at all the other ETF providers nowadays. Um, and I said, well, maybe I'm young enough and maybe I have enough experience and enough energy to set something up on my own. I have a, a desire to be entrepreneurial and I still have the energy. So, you know, I don't want to set up a new business when I'm 75. That's maybe too old for, for me, uh, looking at it as a 32 you know, year old or however old I was at the time. So I said, well, I know investments, I know the, the tax challenges um, and no one was able to provide me with some sort of optimal balance of tax planning, financial planning, investments, goals planning. It just, it was not available anywhere. So it really started me on the path of saying, right, well, maybe I should set up my own RIA. And if I can just find 50 households over, you know, five, six, seven years, well, I can pay the rent and I'll have a nice living and that'll be fantastic. And along the way, I found some other like-minded uh, people to, to set up the firm. And, you know, we said, right, this is a great idea. There's really no one doing it the right way. Let's, let's do this. And so we did. And so Tanager was born. Uh, in, in 2012 uh, with, with zero clients and uh, a lot of energy and a lot of ambition and uh, perhaps not quite realizing how hard it would be to, to, to set up and run a business from zero. Um, but that's how we came. That's how I came to this was uh, given my background in, as, as both in investment management, but also as an expat myself uh, that I just didn't see any solutions I really liked um, out in the, in the marketplace. So, so where did these, partners, co-founders come from? How, how did you find your, your like-minded co-founders? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, one had, had come from a, a prior firm I had worked with um, and was a fantastic guy. And uh, as, as we both uh, were, were talking one day, we said, well, maybe, maybe we could set up something that does something similar. And he had had a background in, in transatlantic lending and mortgages and, and uh, wealth management as well, and had a fantastic career doing that with a lot of great knowledge and expertise uh, and, and, um, successes. And, uh, the, the third partner was an American himself who, uh, similarly had worked in wealth management for many years and had worked in the transatlantic space and had worked with, you know, U S brokers and, uh, RAs, et cetera, and was probably in a different space in their career, looking at more transition and a longer term, uh, way to hand off clients. So the, the three of us said, well, this is fantastic. I think we have, you know, the three-legged stool. Let's, let's have a go at this. And uh, it was really, you know, fortuitous and, and lucky that we had all known each other in various capacities and decided that uh, working together was better than than not working together. So let's let's roll the dice. So, what was the division of of labor? Like, did you carve up? You do this, I'll do that, or or are we all kind of coming together? Say, let's all we're all just going to try to build our our books of clients and and we can share some overhead expenses because it's <laughs> start up. What, what well, was the what was the vision as you were coming together of who is going to do what and what you were trying to build? So we were intentional with building an enterprise from day one, and whether or not that would succeed, we didn't know. Um, but we were intentional with that. You know, let's say you know ten year goal in mind. Um, and so myself, I've, uh, I'm the chief investment officer, and I do have client responsibilities as well. Uh, at the firm still. Um, but in the early days, I, I had a lot of the client responsibilities uh, in the firm. Uh, my other co-founder, Jeff uh, Hedges, um, had his own book of business at Raymond James at the time and had worked with a lot of you know transatlantic families, um, but was at a different stage, a slightly older age uh, than myself, and was really looking at um, how could he have a lasting legacy and ensure that the clients who, you know, at this time, a lot of them are his friends and, you know, and close close colleagues uh, had a safe place to land if, if he were to retire one day. Um, 
but I think he had this burst of energy also that it rejuvenated him and gave him the energy to, to really lean into, um, to building something uh, together. And our, our third co-founder, uh, Alex, um, is really the chief operating officer and, and kind of the cultural standard bearer of the firm. Um, I hate to say that he's just done everything else because it doesn't do a service to how much he has done. Um, but he's really uh, taken charge in terms of uh, building out the team and, and ensuring that a lot of that, you know, teaching and learning and, and culture uh, building has happened in the firm, as well as, you know, the, the duties of a chief operating officer and uh, CEO type of uh, figurehead. So he's really done everything from marketing to, you know, on day one, opening accounts to, you know, setting up our email at Google to everything in between. Um, so, yeah, it was really the three-headed Hydra uh, that came together with energy and uh, blind ambition <laughs> and hope uh, to set up this firm. Very cool. Very cool. So as you've now lived this path over the past decade, what what surprised you the most about actually like building a billion dollar advisory firm enterprise? <laughs> oh, there's been a lot of surprises. Uh, we don't have enough time for all the surprises, <laughs> um, but also that's the fun. I would say that one of the bigger surprises has been that, you know, clients may be wary at first, but they, they really do want the solutions and, and the peace of mind that, that you can offer. And they do want to trust you. Um, even if they've had, you know, maybe a bad experience with a professional advisor in the past, they, they do want to trust you. There's a reason why they're sitting across from you. They do want to hand over, you know, some of the responsibility, if not all the responsibility, but certainly some of the responsibility of, of managing the family's assets and building a plan and making sure everything, you know, works for for them and is pulling towards achieving the goals that they want to achieve. Um, and that means that you really have to be confident in yourself and, and the service that you're offering, because you know if the clients really do want it and they do need it, then you should be confident that you're doing it well. And that's not to say that you, know, you shouldn't keep learning and changing and be humble, but do have some confidence that, that the client does want your service. And it was hard to get over some of that self-doubt uh, in the early days when you have no clients and the phone hasn't rang for three days. Um, right. You know, that's, that's a challenge. <laughs> And you got to get over one, that self doubt. What I would presume only only compounded when you pick a specialized of of a of a target clientele and, and service need as you did with you know cross border expatriates in the in the UK. Like you know, you, you I feel like you get you get you get self doubt about whether you can do the business plus self doubt about whether clients will want to work <laughs> with you plus self doubt of like, am I even giving the right advice or, or, or screwing up some legal issue I missed in one layer of the Venn diagram. Yeah. Uh, I just feel like there's, there's a, there's a lot of layers of, of self doubt. You can crack, you can crack it, in there at the same time. It is. You may not want to peel back that onion because you might start crying. So just, just be confident and, and you can do it and you will find the answer. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. You hit, we, we went through all those emotions uh, regularly <laughs> in the early days. So where did the confidence ultimately come from for you? Well, I think, you know, having other people around, um, I, I think it would be an entirely different discussion to, to set up and run a business uh, yourself as a solo person with absolutely no one around than having, you know, two other great people to, to set up the firm with and then, you know, hiring the first employee and the first you know, new advisor and the second employee and blah, blah, blah. And, and, you know, building the team around that, having people to lean on is, is fantastic. Uh, and I think everyone should set up their business as a, at least with one buddy. Um, and, and not uh, consider doing it on their own. Um, I think having each other, you're just able to to blow off some steam and and reassure and encourage each other to keep going. So that's that's really important. So what was the lowest point for you on this journey? I guess there's there's different low points, right? There's local minima and maxima. If you think back to your calculus in, in college, yeah. Um, in the early days, you know, having zero clients or, or just a handful, and you know, the phone doesn't ring for a week. Um, what's your motivation to get out there and, and go make it ring? And you have to find that motivation, whatever it might be. Um, you know, certainly for me, it was a very much an interest in in solving the challenges. I, I like the Rubik's cube of solving the next challenge, and I was just excited to go find another problem to solve and another another person to help. Um, but you got to find something to to just get out there and and, and keep moving forward. Um, in the in the middle days, I think the lower points are you you find yourself just doing everything and maybe not enjoying it as as you thought you might. That you know, if there's three or four or five people, you're still opening accounts and you're still typing in the ACH or the wire transfer. You're still you know doing literally every single thing that needs to be done, um, and maybe you're not enjoying it because you just you just hit a wall. So you know you got to hire well and, and delegate at that point to to just get out of that. 
Was there a particular wall moment like that for you? Uh, I, th I think there definitely was. Um, we, uh, after we brought on our first advisor, um, who, who's now a partner named Dave, um, he was a great relief uh, to have someone in the office that had a lot of U.S. knowledge. Um, he had worked for 14, 15 years in the U.S. Uh, as, a, as a financial advisor in the Boston area. And he had solved a lot of the U.S. problems um, already and really was the first person to just have to learn the, the U.K. overlay. And I think that took a lot of the pressure off of, of at least the solving of the Rubik's Cubes because he had a lot of great knowledge uh, coming into the firm. Um, I think after that, our first assistant who could do things like just simply answer the phone and reply to you know, emails that came in um, that we weren't taking, you know, getting distracted every hour by answering the phone twice or uh, replying to these emails at the end of the day when you're probably tired. Um, so our when, first assistant was great to just take some of the pressure off of the, of the minutia. Do you recall like, how, how big was the firm when you, when you hired the first assistant? Cause you know, it's, it's hard for most of us when you hire the first staff member, you know, it, it takes a pretty big chunk out of your, yeah. your income take home, which isn't a big number yet. Cause you're still getting going, but like, you know, you had to take your net income divided by three, <laughs> with three partners yeah. and, and, and the assistance coming out of that. So do you recall, like how, how far along did you get before you were ready to make that first hire? Yeah, there were four of us. Um, and then we hired our first assistant and, and she was great. Uh, again, in terms of just, she had been an executive assistant previously and, and understood, um, basically how to run a business. <laughs> she, she told us how to run the business and was fantastic to let us get on with, you know, investing accounts or dealing with a custodian's error or our error at the custodian or finding the next client or doing this, you know, annual review meeting or prospect call or whatever it might've been. Um, she was really invaluable in, in just you know, telling us how to run the business. And, and that was fantastic uh, to do that. But there were four of us at the time. So what else do you know now you wish you could like go back and tell you 10 plus years ago as you were first getting started was the, the wisdom of experience <laughs> brought you could have, you wish you could have told yourself previously. Well, I think, you know, one of the things I didn't quite appreciate back then, but uh, I know that you've been a big disciple of and, and, and um, proselytizing this is, you know, find a niche and, and find a niche of a niche and keep digging a niche hole, like just find, you know, people whose middle names start with B who are dentists and live in this particular zip code, like go get all of them as your clients, go own them, get all eight of them. And, and that's a great niche. And then you will find how that you know, radiates out and builds out from there. Um, but finding a niche gives you the ability to focus and to solve problems that are unique to these people where they immediately see the value of, and there's no longer an argument over fees or let's have a second meeting or a third meeting. It's where do I sign? And, and that's the value of the niche is you, you get that straight through processing much, much quicker. Um, I would also say be authentic. Um, as I mentioned with the planners and the matrix, um, early on, I would perhaps try to uh, say what I think the prospect or client wanted to hear, but maybe just wasn't authentic coming from me. Um, I am a bit of an engineer mindset and I'd probably prefer to work in that manner. And uh, I think I'd probably come off a bit robotic if I'm trying to make lots of small chit chat or um, and, and talk around the houses. Uh, it's just not not me. Um, and, and prospects and clients early days all through that, I think for me. So just be yourself, be authentic. You are who you are. Um, and then lastly, I would say think longer term <clears throat> and do the right thing. Uh, don't worry about what happens tomorrow. <clears throat> if, if it, you got to have a plan for, you know, five, 10, 15, whatever, you have to have some sort of plan longer term and you have to think that way or else you can't possibly achieve any of the milestones along the way. Um, and if you're always doing the right thing, then those two combined are what really build value for your clients and for your business. And I think that guiding principle was something I, I felt in early days, but I don't know if I really believed it. I was still thinking, okay, great. How do we close the next client? What do I need to do to get the next client? And, and maybe deviating and taking some clients that weren't, um, uh, taking on board things that weren't necessarily right for the firm longer term. Uh, you know, clients that didn't quite fit, but you just need a client on day one. So you... I'm curious, you made a comment around, you know, you're like, you can start with, with some kind of niche and, and then, and then you kind of explore it and it evolves from there. Has, has Tanager's focus like evolved and shifted for, for all of you over the past 12 years of doing this? I think what we've found is, you know, 
generically work in the transatlantic space of you know expats and, and people repatriating back home or maybe British people moving to the US who have UK pensions and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that we've just found the next niche that's slightly adjacent to it. So despite the common thread of, of everyone having some sort of US connection um, and having some sort of international connection uh, in their financial lives and their personal lives, what we found is, oh, okay, well, maybe the financial professionals are slightly different from the legal professionals. And, and here are the four key differences that mean something to, to that group, but not to that group and, and vice versa. Um, or here's the, you know, the entrepreneurs and here's the challenges they've had uh, with, with the guilty taxes that were introduced a few years ago that really no one else cares about unless you're an entrepreneur living abroad. Um, and here's something that you know, technology uh, executives at big American tech firms uh, really need to know that probably doesn't apply to the entrepreneur or the, uh, you know, the private equity executive. So it's more about finding the niches that are adjacent and learning more about them. So you keep digging new niches and, and finding new veins uh, to mine. I, I, my brain goes to this analogy. It's kind of like you, you keep zooming in further. Like you, you took a picture, US, UK, uh, transatlantic folks, and then like you've got that picture and you zoom in further and now it's like, well, now that I'm now that I've really been looking at this, like, wait, there's like three or four different groups here because I've got the finance people who are expats. I've got the legal people who are expats. I've got the entrepreneurs living abroad. It's like I don't I don't really have one business of transatlantic expatriates from the US to the UK. Like I have three subversions of it that I could get even more focused. I could get even more niche on. And, yeah, and, and, and so thinking about that well, that that it's it's not like you left it to a, a new, different, adjacent thing. It sounds more it sounds more like you went you went like deeper into it, and they and they started segmenting themselves even further. Yeah, the the first ten chapters of the training manual are are common, and then each chapter after that right. is a specific <laughs> um, right uh, sub niche or, or sub sub niche, and understanding how that's applicable. Um, you know, buying into a partnership at a law firm is, is a different, uh, a different planning challenge to uh, understanding lots and lots and lots of stock options at a technology firm. Uh, they're just two different things, and they don't really apply to the other one. The other person doesn't need, doesn't care about your expertise and stock options if they're a lawyer, and the person at the tech firm doesn't care about understanding partner loans um, and how the tax implications are for two countries. Uh, they probably just care about stock options because that's what they you know, get half their compensation in. So any other advice you would give younger or newer advisors just looking to start their careers and become a financial planner today? I would think the, the best advice anyone could get is, and, and this is probably broadly applicable to, to any career path, is really just understanding um, working hard and finding something that you really enjoy doing. Find puzzles that you like solving. You know, early days for me, it was uh, perhaps programming. I started off as a programmer and moved into the, the exchange traded fund world and found that, you know, new and different and exciting. And there were no rules written just yet back in those days uh, to moving to a new country and learning all about the intersection of another country with the prior country and then learning all about, you know, the, the, how to solve those challenges. Just find something that you're really interested in. If you're not interested in it, you're not going to have a great career. You might be able to pay the rent, but you're not going to have a great career and you're probably not going to enjoy it. So if you are interested in being an advisor, you know, find that space. Do you like the investments more? Do you really want to dig down into the 10th level of how ETFs gain incremental alpha through securities lending inside their portfolio? If you don't like that, then how about financial planning and cash flow yep. planning and understanding pensions and understanding the differences between defined benefit and defined contribution? And how much can you put in to a DB plan if you're 40 versus 50 versus 60? And how much tax will that save a client today, et cetera, et cetera. And if you don't like that, go learn about insurance. <laughs> Maybe you really like it learning about all the bells and whistles attached to insurance policies, but find something that you really like doing and then just learn as much as you possibly can, even to the, you know, even to the detriment of your social life, perhaps in the early years, go work 60, 70 hours and, and just get really good at something. And that then leads into a much bigger window uh, afterwards where you can go do lots of different things, but you'll always be challenged and hopefully always be enjoying what you're doing. So what comes next for you on this journey? That is a, a constant discussion uh, in our partner meetings here at Tanager is what comes next. We're, we're currently working on our, our next five-year plan, uh, having accomplished our 10-year our plan. 
Um, and so we're, we're blessed to have continued growth uh, organic and, and really looking at what other opportunities there are in terms of new locations, whether it's across the US or in the, the EU, you know, on the continent um, or, or inorganic opportunities that might come across our desk. Um, but really it's continuing to, to work on the challenges that have been here since day one, which is that ultimately an RA business is, an RA enterprise, I should say, is uh, an HR and technology platform that you monetize with some financial expertise. So you have to keep building out that platform, whether it's teaching and training and manuals and helping grow you know, other team members or whether it's building on you know, that next piece of technology that enables uh, solving the, the, the tax loss harvesting that you need for concentrated stock positions and client portfolios. So we're really just looking at how do we keep building out that platform of, of solutions, which really boils down to technology and, and HR is what we found. I'm fascinated by that framing. An advisory firm, make sure I got that right. An advisory firm is an HR and technology platform that you monetize with expertise. In finance. Yep. That's it. In finance. I really like that. I, really I have to like say, that. I can't take credit for that. I did steal that uh, from someone at Barclays Global Investors in the early days who described BGI not as at the time, uh, still the world's largest asset manager, about $500 billion or so of assets at the time, but that BGI was a technology platform that monetized the technology through index funds and some quantitative alpha products that we had for institutions. And I had never heard anyone in finance say that before. <laughs> I had never heard that. But a lot of people at BGI thought that BGI was a tech platform. Interesting. But since this is ultimately uh, advisory firms are service businesses and knowledge businesses, you frame this as this is an HR and technology platform. Like we have to get good at attracting and developing and retaining talent. That becomes your distinguishing uh, that, firm or like platform solution, platform value. That's exactly right. Uh, unless robo advisors take over the world and you can truly scale and have a million clients, you know, with no humans, if, if, unless that can really happen, which I am not convinced it, it really ever will, um, then you're going to have some bottleneck as, as a human who has the relationships and has some of the expertise in, in working with clients. And so therefore you have to be an HR platform to make sure that you're always building and growing and, and, and also weeding out, you know, some of the challenging uh, people over time. So as we, as we come to the end of this conversation, this is a podcast about success. And, and just one of the themes that comes up is the, the word success means very, very different things to different people. And so you built what, you know, clearly is a, a wonderfully successful advisory business enterprise as you're crossing a billion dollars of, of asset or management, setting, setting the new five-year plan, having conquered the 10-year plan. So the, the business is in a wonderful place. How do you define success for yourself at this point? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, I think for myself, success is really, um, there's a few parts to it, but one is always constant growth and challenges. You know, each stage is different, and requires different skills, approach, mindset, resources, and you have to embrace that change. You know, I, I'm not a surfer, although I have tried surfing uh, when I lived in California and I can appreciate kind of standing on the board and the waves always moving under you and you've just got to try to stay on top of it. And if I was a better surfer, I'd probably have a better analogy, but that kind of fits the, the way the earth is just moving underneath of you and you've got right. to keep moving with it and changing and evolving. And also, hence why we named the firm after, after Darwin, who obviously came up with natural selection. Also, I think success is something that building something that lasts and it's not just a quick buck. Um, I mean, wouldn't it be nice to to make money? Sure, we, we do need money to live. It's a money world. But wouldn't it be nice to build something that lasts and outlasts you and you know have, whether it's a brand or a name or just an entity and, and, and knowing that you've touched the lives of, of many, many people, uh, that, I guess, legacy is, is great to think about and hopefully is something that we're all, you know, as a team building towards. Um, and then lastly, I guess, just enjoying the ride and the, the people that you touch and that you work with. Um, you know, I, I can't take all the credit for this firm. There's, as I said, there were co-founders and, and they're still with us and lots and lots of team members since and lots and lots of clients have joined since. Um, so, you know, really enjoying the ride and the people that you touch. Uh, if you're not enjoying the, the ride or the people around you, then, you know, you should change it. Um, so I think success is, is enjoying that ride. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Christopher, for joining us on the 
Financial Advisor Success Podcast. It's my pleasure, Michael. Thank you very much for having me. It's been really great speaking with you. Absolutely. Thank you. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com, where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the members section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits, along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.